Good morning. Welcome to worship this Sunday, February 14th. Um, some people know it as Valentine's Day, uh, but in our church life, it is another Sunday where we can recognize our Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And so the Lord be with you. I want to take a moment to look at our bulletin and the life of our church this week. And again, uh, if you don't have a bulletin in front of you and you need one, you can always go to the church website. There are bulletins online as well as our calendars and our newsletter that are there for you to see all the time. If you want uh, to get that bulletin uh, through the prayer chain, so, may, and make sure you sign up for the prayer chain. It comes through that avenue as well. Or if you have any questions about the bulletin that I'm talking about and you can't get it through any of those channels, you can certainly call the church office and we can get any of this information to you today. What I want to start out with is actually talking about the beginning of our Lenten journey. This Wednesday begins the 40-day journey from Ash Wednesday to the cross. And so we're doing a couple of different things this Ash Wednesday. There are a little bit different probably than we're used to. We certainly wanna make sure that we are maintaining uh, our safety measures. And so we will have an Ash Wednesday service. It will be in person and online, but it's taking place at 10 a.m on February 17th on Wednesday, just like it's a Sunday. So our Sunday worship starts at 10 a.m. Our Ash Wednesday service is going to start at 10 a.m. And it will be available, of course, afterwards on YouTube for those of you who cannot make it at 10 a.m. on a Wednesday. So in keeping with the COVID guidelines, we have to be very careful about ashes. So ashes will be self-administered on the back of someone's hand or forehead. And if you are worshiping online, you may request a vial of ashes to be delivered to you, or you can pick them up at the church office. If you need to, and you really want to participate, and you have no other means, you can certainly use potting soil or garden soil. If you happen to have a palm leaf from a past Palm Sunday worship, you can burn that and use the ashes for Ash Wednesday because that's how the Ash Wednesday ashes are, or how they come from. They come from the burned palm leaves of the Palm Sunday the year before. So that's taking place on Wednesday. Also, we are going to be doing a Bible study, study through Zoom that will also start uh, on Ash Wednesday, February 17th. That does not start at 10 a.m., however. Uh, that will begin at 6.30 p.m., and that goes all the way through till March 31st. There's an insert in the bulletin that talks about that. Uh, so, again, make sure you get a hold of that insert so you can see the details for that Bible study. We've been talking about that the last few weeks, so some of you might remember what we're going to be studying. Then let's walk through what happens as we go toward the end of Lent. So typically we have a Palm Sunday um, and everybody's packed into worship. We want to be really responsible about this. We're not sure what the world's going to look like on Palm Sunday. So that takes place on March 28th. That's Palm Sunday and we're going to be doing it like we're doing it now. There will be the in-person option. There will also be an online worship. And then as we walk through Holy Week, we will be doing a Monday, Thursday online service. That's on April 1st. There will be a Good Friday service online, and that's April 2nd. And Pastor Lynn is putting something together about the Stations of the Cross. And then we will celebrate Easter Sunday, April 4th, the same way that we celebrated Palm Sunday. We will be doing the in-person worship, if you'd like, 
and an online worship as well. We don't want any super spreader events. We want to keep everybody as safe as possible. But we also want to worship and celebrate Easter this year. So those are the options. And we'll, of course, remind you of those as the weeks progress. But that's just kind of what's on our horizon, and I wanted to let you know about that. Let's talk about some other things uh, that are in the life of our church. One that's related to this, there's another insert in the bulletin about Easter lilies. So if you would like to purchase an Easter lily this year, either in honor of or in memory of a loved one, please make sure that you fill out that insert and return it to the office or to a diaconate member by March 15th. So you have a month to do that. Now the only disclaimer on our Easter lily orders this year is we will not be delivering them. So you'll have to pick them up after worship on Easter Sunday. Or if you know someone who's attending worship physically, ask them to pick up an Easter flower for you and then they can deliver it to you. The information of course about that is again in your bulletin. We are continuing with our grief support group and that's meeting via email. There's a lot of things to grieve for. It's not necessarily the loss of someone. It could be the loss of something or something that you are grieving about. So please feel free to contact Claudia Little about that. Her email address is again in the bulletin and you can find out more information about the grief support group. And then good news, our rummage rooms have reopened. As long as we're maintaining where we are as far as the COVID rate or decreasing, we are going to be open on Saturdays from 9 a.m. till noon. So shoppers, of course, have to follow all of the guidelines. When you come as a shopper, you only have 20 minutes. Uh, there is nothing that you can try on and there are no returns. We just want to make sure that everything is safe. So, so far, everyone has been cooperative. It's worked out. We're maintaining social distance. We have safety protocols in place and we just ask that you maintain those. And if you are wanting to drop off or things that you want to deliver to the rummage room, please note that that is only by appointment. We want to make sure that it's spread out and not everyone's showing up at the same time. So either contact Claudia Little or Melody Hayward and their numbers are, you guessed it, in the bulletin. So take a look at the bulletin also and it kind of gives you some updates on things that we are in need of in that rummage room as well. I know it might not look it, but the days are getting longer. That means spring is on the way, and that means spring cleaning. And as you do that, look at that list. We might have some need for what you are cleaning and looking to downsize. Certainly there are more announcements in the bulletin. The last one I want to just make note of is as we go toward our time of calling to worship and prayer, keep in mind our friend of the week. Our friend of the week is Pat Lewis. Uh, we have her uh, information in the bulletin as far as her address. Lift her up as she's been kind of struggling with her health. Uh, she is Marsha's sister in case you're not making that connection. And so we want to lift her up in prayer. And of course, as I always say, we want to make sure that we lift up our emergency care workers, our military, our police, firefighters, anybody that is serving our nation, that is fighting this disease, that is putting themselves second and putting other people first. Always lift those people up in prayer. So we'll continue to do that as we worship today. So let's come to our time now where we focus our hearts, we center ourselves on where we need to be spiritually to hear and feel and use the Word of God as we now go to our call to worship this morning. Hear our call to worship this morning. This is your world we step upon. 
the air we breathe, the food we eat. This is your world we step upon, the sounds we hear, the people we meet. This is your world we step upon, your footsteps where I place my feet. Now would you join me as we pray the invocation. Eternal God, whose signature we see, if we dare to look, and the creation of the universe, help us this hour to look and to listen for your handwriting and your voice in this place among these people. Connect our temporary praise to your timeless rhythms, your ageless melodies, your everlasting joyful noise. Guide us now to focus upon you, knowing that in you, our distractions become new possibilities for action. Breathe life into our singing, our praying, our speaking, our listening, our silence that all these activities might become more than they are. In our worship, we reach out to you, O God, knowing that you have already enfolded us in your arms. Thank you. Amen. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my day. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me, and I. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily this is my daily bread. Your very words spoken to me, and I. This 
This is the air I breathe You are my daily bread This is my daily Would you bow with me in prayer this morning? Today is Transfiguration Sunday, O oh God. We know your story of transformation, and we pray for your spirit to transform us, transform our eyes to see the light of your glory, transform our minds to understand a fraction of your will. Transform our hearts to feel the goodness of your presence. Transform our world to recognize the ties that bind us to one another. We give you thanks, Lord, for the goodness of your words, the goodness of your world, and the goodness of your spirit who beckons us to follow. Give us the mind of Peter to recognize that we stand on holy ground. Give us the humility to proclaim, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Like Peter, we want to build a tent on the mountaintop away from the problems and distractions of the world, just as you did for Peter, O oh God. Let us sit in your glory just long enough to recharge for the journey and then send us out for your service in your world. Make us know as well, O oh God, that our worth does not come from our works our performance on tests or tasks or jobs does not determine our value. Our worth, our identity, our very being comes from you, O God of grace. In your image, we are created. In your grace, we are redeemed. In your community, we are loved. In your spirit, we are called. As the disciples were, oh God, we are often overcome by fear, anxiety, grief, or sadness. Pour your healing into our wounds. Breathe your goodness into our doubts. Touch us, heal us, and bring us peace. Today we lift before you the people in our church and in our world who are hurting. The list is long. But give us the hope and faith, O Holy One, to look and round and to look up, to look in and see your presence around us. Give us the strength to know that we are not alone. We join our voices with your disciples across all times and places as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I may love 
dost love and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure. Until with thee I will thy will to do and to We have two scripture readings this morning. The first is Old Testament and the second is New Testament. And from the Old Testament, let's look at Leviticus chapter 19. We'll start with verses 1 to 2 and then switch to verse 9 and read to 18. And I'm reading from the NIV version today. So Leviticus 19, 1 to 2. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And then switching down to 9. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal, do not lie, do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. Do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Keep my decrees. And then we're going to switch to the New Testament, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Again, we're going to break it up starting with verse 10 and 11, and then going down to verse 16. So 1 Corinthians 3, starting with verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a master builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid which is Jesus Christ. And then going down to 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, He should become a fool, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are of Christ 
and Christ is of God. May God bless the holy reading of his word. Well, once again, I have another confession to make. I fear I am an addict of sorts. I can't seem to shake it. I do it every day. I think about it all the time. I have binge-worthy moments. And I really don't even want to stop. Hello, my name is Alex. And I am obsessed with home improvement shows. My love of them started years ago with the television show Fixer Upper and the couple Chip and Joanna Gaines. It ran on HGTV from 2013 to 2018. And during that final episode, as I was mourning the loss of this show and the hole it would leave in my life, I may or may not have cried several times. I have no witnesses, so we don't know for sure if that's true. After that final show was over, eventually other shows rose up that I really do truly love and they helped fill that home improvement void. Hometown and Fixer to Fabulous, but Fixer Upper is back, baby. Oh yeah! New shows started on January 30th, and I am falling down that rabbit hole once again. Some might call it fanatical, but I actually do have some concrete and I would argue relevant reasons for loving this show so much. And I really do have a point that is scriptural, so bear with me for a moment and hear me out. So, the top five reasons that I love Fixer Upper. One, I love things that make me feel at home. There is a reason why I am fairly particular about the flowers I pick for my property every year. That I have all sorts of items from Canada in my home and in my offices. And then I usually put up Christmas decorations way before I should. And I leave them up way longer than I should. I love looking at things that make me feel at home. And I love being surrounded by things that make me feel at home. And let's face it, Fixer Upper, this show is pretty much chock full of that stuff. Whether you're looking at architecture or design or jo Joanna's fashion. I love things that make me feel at home. Number two, I love a good before and after. Fixer Upper loves the shock value of an incredible makeover. And week after week, the results are spectacular. They can take an absolute dump and make it into a mansion. I love a good before and after. Three, I love how Chip and Joanna Gaines ground their family in faith. I love that as a couple, they are unapologetic about their faith, but also not exploitative either. They have a set of values they believe in, and this comes through as they design spaces meant for families and friends to gather, break bread together, and be in real and authentic community. Chip and Joanna Gaines ground their family in faith. And the fourth reason I love Fixer Upper is I love Chip Gaines's antics. He does some really strange things like taking a bet to eat a cockroach, launching himself through walls, or smashing his head with a can. But I appreciate Chip's sense of humor and zest for life. And the fifth reason I love Fixer Upper. 
I love that every episode, they build something with purpose. There is a reason behind every decision the Gaineses make when they are working on a house, whether those decisions are related to safety or budget or construction or design. Everything they do has a specific purpose and no part of the process is meaningless. So, what the heck does this have to do with what we're talking about today? As I was reading that scripture from 1 Corinthians and then thinking about it, particularly the comparison Paul makes to a, a skilled master builder laying a foundation and then someone else building on top of it. I could not help but think of Fixer Upper because more often than not, they rebuild, they build those Fixer Uppers on top of foundations that have already been poured. The aesthetics of the house may change, but the foundation of the home remains intact. Well, isn't that what Paul is saying here? The, the churches we build and the Christians we become may look aesthetically different from one another, but the foundation of our faith and the true foundation of every church, Jesus Christ, always remains intact. Now, we started 1 Corinthians, the reading today, in chapter 3. But earlier in this chapter and then before, Paul is talking about uh, divisions in the church. They were no different than the churches today. Uh, divisions related to allegiances, though, in this time, they were forming with different religious leaders and teachers. And while to some extent Paul was still talking about this in the passage we read, he really went deeper to talk about why this sense of unity is so important. Paul believed that churches needed to be unified in God in order for them to grow and thrive. And the reason for this, Paul said, was because Jesus had already laid the foundation of the church. That part had already been done. So the church needed now to build on top of that foundation, not build another one build on top of the foundation already laid by Jesus Christ. Because building on top of anything else would render a structure unstable and not strong enough. Reminds me of that song, and I've talked about it since this COVID shutdown, but the man who builds his house upon a rock, and then the man who builds his house upon the sand, and the differences between those two. We need to build our church, our faith, on the rock that Jesus has already laid, that foundation. 1 Corinthians 3.11 said it this way, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now Paul, of course, had a vested interest in this church, in this community. He himself planted that church in the city of Corinth, and he obviously wanted it to succeed. But his words are powerfully spoken to more than this one church. These words speak to us today in our lives and in our church and in this Christian story that we are writing together. We are building something 
in our lives. Every day, every decision we make, every journey we take creates something in our lives and in the story of our faith. And so Paul's words remind us that we have to be intentional about this process. We have to ask ourselves, what are we building? What are we building in our lives? What are we building in our faith? What are we building in our church? And perhaps the harder question to ask might be this. What do we want to build? Or rather, what is God calling us to build? All of us certainly are at different stages of our lives, and every stage of life comes with new challenges, something new to build on this foundation, whether we are in school or growing our career or raising families or walking through a challenging medical crisis or understanding the nuances of empty nesting or learning how to accept care when we have always cared for others. We are building something piece by piece. And while we may not always get to control the circumstances surrounding what we are building, we do get to make some choices in the process. We figure out the how, the where, and the what. How are we going to build this? Where do we start? What tools do we use? And interestingly enough, part of the answer comes from the Old Testament. We're talking about a New Testament passage building on the foundation that Christ has already laid, but some of the answer to what we're building on top of that comes in the book of Leviticus. It's the third book of the Bible, and that's part of the narrative of Moses, also known as the Torah or the Pentateuch. And this passage that we read from Leviticus today gives a really practical discourse on how we can live our lives as people of God, as something to build on that foundation. It offers simple, basic practices for us as human beings as we try to navigate this crazy world, build our lives, and grow our faith. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't fraud others. Don't judge people unfairly. Don't profit from other people's misfortunes. Don't hold hate in your heart. And ultimately, as Jesus himself recalled, love your neighbor as yourself. This is how we ought to live our lives. And those truths from Leviticus ring as true today as they did back then. These are the tools we need to build our lives our faith, and our church. Every piece we add on top of that foundation should hold basic principles of love, human decency, and hospitality. This is what the Bible tells us over and over again. This is how we can and will Build something meaningful and life-changing in our lives. And this is how we can and will build something meaningful and life-changing in our church as well. What are we building at this church? What do we want to build? What is God calling us to build. He 
here's the thing. We are as much a part of this church's story as it is part of our story. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I, for one, want to write a story that is worth telling in the years to come. Paul called upon the people of Corinth to build their church on the foundation that Christ had already poured. And it seems to me that we must heed this call in our church today. We must be intentional about what we are building. We must take care with every single piece we set. And we must build on the foundation Christ gave us. We must ground ourselves in the life-changing truths of the gospel and the Old Testament and be diligent about living that, living those things out. But not just in our lives, but also within this community. This community within the four walls of the church building and outside those walls. We must build something here that is worthy of the glory of God, of the gospel that has been given to us, and of the lives and ministries God is calling us into. Now, I said earlier that this scripture in 1 Corinthians made me think of Fixer Upper. And here's why. Because... When I think about the five reasons I love that show, they mirror some of the exact same reasons and exact same things I love about the church. So, I gave you my five reasons I love Fixer Upper. Here are five reasons I love my church. One, I love things that make me feel at home. I love the beautifully arranged flowers and the seasonal decorations that our church family puts together throughout the year. I love my Sunday school class and the way we have formed a family and breathed the life and purpose into a space. I love powerful music that resonates not only through the walls, but through the very essence of my soul. And I love the mouth-watering food that everyone makes and the cards that go out to our friends of the week and our shut-ins, and I could go on and on and on. Here at this church, we create a home. And I love things that make me feel at home. The second reason I love this church I love a good before and after. The church is about changing lives. And while there's no giant portrait of us that gets pulled away to reveal a new and improved self every week, the shock value of the life-changing magic of the gospel is ever-present here in our worship, in our fellowship, and in our mission work. And we do the hard work that is required of us to build this church. Lives are being changed. And that is the good news of Jesus Christ. That is resurrection in motion. And that's the second reason I love this church. I love a good before and after. The third reason I love this church I love how the church grounds its community in faith. I love that this church gives individuals, couples, and families a safe space to learn and grow in their faith. In today's world, it is not always easy to proclaim our faith outside of our walls. And nowadays, Christianity is getting a bad rap. And while I would argue that now more than ever, it is important that we do talk about our faith, 
this church gives people a safe space to be who they are and listen to who God is calling them to be. It gives people a place to learn about Christian values, ask questions, pray for each other, and hold one another accountable. I love how the church grounds its community in faith. And the fourth reason, I love our church's antics. Now, we do not have a chip games running amok eating cockroaches, or at least I don't think we have anyone who does that. But we do have choir members that may or may not get out of control, candles that won't stay lit during the service, and we may have to run to Giant very quickly to get communion supplies and barely make it in time. Sometimes it seems like a comedy of errors around here. But folks, this is just what grace in motion looks like. We learn at this church that it is okay to laugh and that we do not have to be perfect. And we do a lot of both. I love our church's antics. And lastly, the fifth reason I love this church. I love that every day we build something with purpose. Every day we are building something with purpose at this church. Whether we are shoveling snow or leading worship, there is a reason for everything we do. If you come to this church and participate in one way or another, whether physically or virtually, you are part of that purpose. I would argue that there is not only a place for you at this church, but there is a purpose for you at this church as well. There are so many ways to participate in the life of this church and this scripture that we read today reminds us that as long as we are building on the foundation of Jesus Christ, we are building something that will change people's lives. This church is a place where people are baptized, where people in need are cared for, where gifts are transformed into ministries, where prayers are lifted up and where people of all backgrounds come together to worship, to serve, and to learn. This church is a place where breaking bread together is not only a sign of nourishment, but also friendship and family and covenant. This church is a place where the secular becomes sacred, and the ordinary becomes holy. This church is a place we are building together. So let us heed the call. Let us, like Paul said, according to the grace given to us, build something with purpose. Let us heed the call to build on the foundation Christ set for us in our lives, in our faith, and in our church. The First Baptist Church of Cuba, New York. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we ask you to build your godly structure in our lives, our families, and ministry, built upon love, faith, and hope, and to tear down ungodly structures built on selfishness, pride, and ambition. Lord, bring the living stones into alignment with you, 
the chief cornerstone. Align us to your sound and your frequency that we may vibrate and resonate with you, Lord Jesus. Lord, release the gifts of the Spirit to equip us and connect us to you and the body of Christ in unity of faith, fullness of Christ, joined and knit together, each doing our share, edifying one another in love. Lord, may each of your living stones shine with your glory and radiate your light, wisdom, joy, peace, and love to a lost and dying world. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, a name above every other name Jesus, the only one that could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh we live for you, and only there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are.
we have throughout the week collected tithes and offerings. You may have put them in the plate when you came today. Perhaps you mailed them in. Or maybe you're giving a gift today of your talent, of your time. Before we dedicate all those things, for those in the sanctuary, would you stand as we listen to the doxology this morning? Would you pray with me this morning over our tithes and offerings? Heavenly Father, we give thee but thine own, all that we have, all that we are, whether we recognize it or not, comes from you and through you. And so we give back to you in kind. Lord, we ask that you take our tithes, our offerings, our gifts, ourselves. Take them and use them for your service. Breathe into them your life, your presence. And then let us breathe your presence to those within our reach to those within the sound of our voice, and then to those beyond that. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. God of grace and God of glory. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power crown thine ancient church's story bring it bud to glorious flower grant us wisdom grant us courage for the facing of this hour for the facing of this and now would you stand if you are not already standing? You don't have to stand in your homes, but if you'd like to, you may. But hear now the benediction this morning. God, we ask that you shore up our foundation. There may be construction going on, but with you all things are made new. And Lord, like the transfiguration that we recognize today, we see your glory. We want to dwell and bask in it. But help us to know that your glory lies within us. And we take that and spread it to your world. Amen. And amen. <laughs>